This may be a lot of things, this moment we're living through, but it is definitely not about black lives. And remember that when they come for you, and at this rate, they will. The Democratic Party is trying to replace the current electorate, the voters now casting ballots, with new people, more obedient voters from the third world. But they become hysterical because that's, that's what's happening, actually. They will come for you and replace you. This is an elaborate conspiracy theory that is gaining traction right now on the American right. It's a white supremacist claim, and it is that non-white immigrants will replace the electorate, the presumably more white electorate. Now, this matters because it's racist and dangerous and influential, with proponents trying to hide and launder and dress up a hateful dogma in a kind of pseudo-intellectual policy framework, peddling warnings about the replacement of white people as some kind of policy discourse on immigration or cultural heritage. Our special report right now explores this history and exposes this fraud with an eye on an ugly, terrible history that we all know about. You even learned about it in grade school. And it is proven, history has taught us, it is not effective to ignore or minimize these kind of ideologies and this kind of hatred this kind of racism and this kind of anti-Semitism when it crops up, as it repeatedly does in many societies with any level of diversity, be it religious or racial. And it's especially tough when economic times get hard and community harmony frays. Now, this replacement theory that I'm going to tell you about right now fixates specifically on immigration. It starts with a claim to an allegedly neutral position, the claim that, well, most countries set limits on immigration, and that can include some type of standards for who is admitted to the country. Okay, true enough. Then it pivots into white supremacist racism, arguing that countries like France or the U.S. are inherently white, so immigration limits must patrol against any racial minorities or foreigners to stop them from, quote, replacing the allegedly current white residents replace the current electorate with new people, more obedient voters from the third world. You will not replace us! You will not replace us! This is a purposeful resettlement. White replacement theory. No, no, no. This is a voting rights question. It's going to be millions of illegal yes, immigrants yes. into the United States. They're coming to a neighborhood near you. We are being invaded. They're coming to our backyard. It's your country. You own it, you pay for it, you were born here. It belongs to you. This theory is a new spin on some very old types of arguments, some of which do remain so discredited that even these proponents insist they're not actually endorsing those other things, those other ideologies, that other type of white supremacy or Nazi ideology. Now, Donald Trump did say there were good people at that infamous Charlottesville rally as the neo-Nazis openly chanted against replacement. And many right-wingers do traffic in this direct kind of hate. But this is what's important about this particular thing tonight. The history of hate shows that it also rises in more insidious and even subtle and sophisticated garb. From Europe to the U.S., white-dominated societies have wrongly claimed that nature or testing or science provide some sort of distinctions for elevating a white ruling class and excluding others. America, built on a system of racial slavery, Jim Crow racism continuing long after the legal end of slavery itself. For immigration, the U.S. limited immigrants from a wide range of countries. Congress barred people from Asia in the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1880s. It sought other ways to limit Irish Catholic, and Jewish migrants. And when people did try to challenge that blatant discrimination, the courts upheld the rules. An Indian man, Bhagat Singh Tin, tried to find one loophole by asserting under law that he could be counted as maybe Caucasian because he was from North India. But the Supreme Court left no doubt, ruling against him stating, quote, the physical characteristics of the Hindus render them readily distinguishable from those seen as white. So that legal ground was clear for Congress to go further. In 1924, there was a bipartisan consensus for an immigration crackdown. Here's a bill passed overwhelmingly, 62 to 6. 
And you see there, ban on Asiatics made operative. That was 1924. Just one year later, The Great Gatsby came out, a book mocking rich white elites. And by the way, it shows the villain talking up the kind of white supremacy that also would later animate this replacement theory. If we don't watch out, the white race will be utterly submerged. No, that's so. It's up to us who are the dominant race to watch out or these other races will have control of things. So it's certainly not a question of if it can happen here. It's whether it will happen here again fully. It was only within the last 70 years that U.S. immigration rules ended those direct limits I showed you under law on people from Asia. It's only in that time span that the U.S. dismantled legal quotas and other limits amidst explicit pressure from civil rights protests in the 1960s. Having a president who even publicly embraces a diverse immigration approach is a relatively new feature in American life. In 1998, then-President Clinton, a lawyer who knew the history I just briefly showed of America's immigration laws, saw what was coming. And he tried to urge America to face these changing demographics head-on, to welcome them. He tried to urge people to see all of this as a source of strength and unity. He basically was trying to talk to white Americans about deciding what to do, since this has always been a nation of immigrants. Today, largely because of immigration, there is no majority race in Hawaii or Houston or New York City. In a little more than 50 years, there will be no majority race in the United States. What do the changes mean? They can either strengthen and unite us, or they can weaken and divide us. We must decide. Decide. And how do people decide? How do people make decisions? Well, by their own experience, right? Their emotions, maybe sometimes reason. But also by reacting to cues from who they see as leaders, influential voices, social circles. On the right, those sources more openly embrace raw hate these days. And this year now embrace its dressed up cousin replacement theory. But there's also this emerging younger American demographics and electorate that's embracing a more diverse population and more cosmopolitan mixing or whatever you want to call it, people just existing together. But they're pitted against this retrograde group, reaching backwards for anything that might stop the change or justify it with this junk science. The people trying to stop these so-called invasions from abroad might be surprised to learn this replacement theory itself is from abroad. As an idea, it's an immigrant. It's a non-American concept from abroad. Now, that's not by any means one of the largest problems with replacement theory. It's just an ironic side note. And not only that, it's from a country that many conservative Americans have spent years mocking, a nation that clashed so much with the Republican Bush administration, they even once retitled French fries, freedom fries. I'm talking about France. Now, this is a serious issue tonight. If it were a different topic, we might run a clip of the evil French race car driver from Talladega Nights, a comedy that really mocks anti-immigrant and specifically anti-French sentiment on the American right. But this is too serious to do that. Maybe another time. But replacement theory is from France. I'm serious about that. Conservative writer and right-wing politician Renaud Camus, who you see here, he literally lives in a 14th century castle with a 10-story tower, quite the real estate. You can see his lifestyle right there. And he drew on much of the ugly history I just explored with you to, in his view, warn white people in France or other white majority countries of what he sees as a, quote, great replacement of their original population with newer arrivals, mostly from Africa, those immigrants that he is afraid of. This is one face of modern white supremacist pseudoscience, claiming to draw on books or policy and flipping concepts of human rights and crimes against humanity back into a supposed attack on a white ruling class who he argues, who he alleges, who he warns are about to become the victims. 
the change of people and, uh, and enough civilization. Great replacement is the darkest thing which can happen. I think the uh, crime against humanity in the 21st century is the great replacement. You think it is the crime against humanity yes. of our times? Yes. Yes, very much so. The question is, is it time now for white Anglo-Saxon, English-speaking Americans to be substituted in the turn as Indians were? By English-speaking, he again means white. Camus, under the First Amendment, has the right to share his words across the United States. Issues not censorship. But many are drawing on his words to do crime, hate crimes, violence, murder. Now, we're deep into this special report with all the history. We have not spent much time on the history of the Nazis and the Holocaust in Europe. And very few topics are clarified with comparisons to Nazis. But neo-Nazis compare themselves to Nazis. They are the modern Nazis. They say so. They are the ones quoting Camus in their marches. That 2017 right-wing rally in Charlottesville was the moment in America that many people first heard a direct reference to this replacement theory. Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! You also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Jews will not replace us! Those neo-Nazis take this replacement hatred literally, as do some recent white supremacist mass murderers like the gunman who killed over 50 people in a New Zealand mosque in those attacks, or the El Paso shooter who killed over 20 people in a Walmart. Some of the worst documented hate crimes in modern history. Those murderers invoked this conspiracy theory by name. The El Paso shooter wrote a diatribe claiming to defend the U.S. from cultural and ethnic replacement and stated that this theory made him target Latinos because the Hispanic community was not their target before, quote, I read the great replacement. Camus says that he condemns that violence. He also said after the New Zealand mass murder that he still welcomes how his ideas are spreading. <clears throat> Noting he does not object to people seeing the, what he calls, ethnic substitution that's in progress in his country. No, he says, to the contrary. He does not object to that notoriety, to those followings. Ideas and prejudice and hate, they spread in all sorts of ways. Those neo-Nazis know that many conspiracy theories and justifications against Jews and gay people and racial minorities spread for many, many years before the 1940s. Today, some of this can be tracked even more precisely in real time. Google has this mountain of data on what people search. And people are noticing this right now this year more than before. We can show it to you. Google has the data that shows you see the interest in replacement theory pretty stagnant in over a decade period there. Even during, really, around the 2019, 2019 shooting, some greater interest. And then the largest spike in Google Trends is this year, it's right now, it's after Trump's leaving office, it's 2021. The term pushed on Fox News, and if some people had not heard much about it yet or thought much about it yet, Fox anchors are changing that, putting it out into the bloodstream, getting people Googling, thinking, talking about it, deciding whether or not this is something that can justify something. And then even though I just showed you most people aren't aware of it, the same Fox anchors claim that people were already preemptively upset about the term's use. At the left and all the little gatekeepers on Twitter become literally hysterical if you use the term replacement. This is a purposeful resettlement yeah. of, it's going to be millions of illegal yes. immigrants yes. into the United States. This is what those influential voices and leaders are pushing. There you had, of course, a senator and the number two presidential candidate in the Republican Party, Ted Cruz, to Donald Trump, nodding along. So the claim goes from the fringe 
to the hate groups, to what passes for mainstream conservative opinion, and then moves into the halls of power, where Ted Cruz and other members of Congress, and now some Republican officials, are either nodding along or literally invoking the exact theory linked to all this hate. The revolution has begun. We are being invaded, and they're not invited. We're replacing national-born American, native-born Americans per to permanently transform the political landscape of this very nation. Republican Congressman Matt Gates, Tucker Carlson is all caps correct. The so-called replacement theory. The illegals who are here, who right. are gonna take our education, our health care. There's nothing new about white supremacists then claiming to be the victim while attacking less powerful groups. Hate crimes are generally on the rise in the U.S. right now, along with rising overall crime rates during the pandemic. We also have the division of an insurrection we just lived through and a movement bent on justifying all of this. You take it together and the stakes are high. The challenges are not new. America and many societies have beaten these ideologies before. There are evil, irredeemable people in this world, as there were in past generations, as there may be in future generations. But if you look at history, as we have here a little bit together tonight, massive movements that change countries and start wars do not need a majority to act only on racism and evil. They actually tend to do something very different. They tend to build on that core, perhaps, but then offer junk science and other theories and other claims to say that certain groups are inferior, to scapegoat, to use an old word, to say that this or that policy is actually a good thing to protect and improve something good, the society. And they do that so other people, some might be in on it, some might be ignorant, other people come along and start to think, well, maybe this is all okay. And that's how you really get more people on board. The ideas and premises matter. If they didn't, then even the neo-Nazis would not really bother quoting these faraway authors and castles, would they? It is very literally a war of ideas and ethics. And for those of us who believe in civilization and equality, and there are many of us, many of us, it is always better to pay attention, to think, to face it down and wage and win this war of ideas first to foresaw any alternative.